Welcome to the Regenerative World podcast. How many of you enjoy food and like to know where it comes from? To grow own food and to know how it is produced is more and more important to people from all around the world. And also the interest in permaculture increases. My name is Vanessa Vilian Babich and I'm the co-founder of the Regenerative Circular Innovation Organization CircleConnect. Thank you very much for joining this episode. Today we speak with Javi Carrera. He is permaculture author, educator and activist for more than 20 years. We will talk about regenerative food, how permaculture allows to reconnect to nature and how permaculture is connected to all areas of our life. Javier is leading multiple initiatives. He is the founder and social coordinator of the Seed Guardians Network, editor of Alpa magazine and president of Grupo Alpa Foundation, editor-in-chief of the Madre Semilla educational platform and Radio Semilla podcast, and research director of the first inventory of the food heritage of Ecuador. We are excited to dive into the world of regenerative food and living. Hello, Javier. Do you want to start with telling us a little bit about yourself and why you started to be active in the field of permaculture and regenerative food? Hello, Vanessa, and thank you for having me here. Uh, hello to you all listeners. Well, um, in short, it, it was out of desperation that I started this, this path, because when I was growing up here in Ecuador, I was uh, very aware of the misery that our people uh, has to live through, the high levels of poverty, the injustice, and also, I always had, when I was a kid, a high level of echophilia. You know what it is? It's supposedly, we all humans have it when we are kids. This uh, simple and very profound love for nature. And uh, we are teached out of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. To become more rational and more oriented towards profit and all that. But I could never get into this uh, more educated mentality. For me, uh, this feeling uh, about nature was so strong that I actually forced my parents to move to the countryside because I couldn't live in the city. I moved when I was five years old to the countryside. And uh, when I was like 17 or something, this landscape where I grew up, which was countryside, as I, I, farms and things like that, uh, was destroyed by, by the city moving towards, towards that region. And uh, I was really heartbroken with all that. So, but I felt, you can imagine, I was kind of a solitary kid and all that. Um, I felt completely uh, unable to, to, to answer this challenge. I felt powerless. And uh, at, at, at one point, I was already working as a journalist uh, in the year 2000, no, 98. In the year 98, I was working as a, as a journalist and I couldn't stand it anymore. Like all the bad news, all the... The live, living in the city and all that. So I decided to move to the countryside, but really far away. I wanted to be a hermit in the hills alone, all by myself. And I realized that the first thing I needed to know in order to, to do this for real was to learn how to cultivate food, to create my own food. And at that point, uh, I believe that actually agriculture was one of the most boring things ever. Because the image I had of agriculture was the conventional one. I, that, but I decided to learn about it. And I was lucky enough to find a, a, a couple of organic uh, farmers who were willing to teach me. But the thing is, after four months of, of, of learning, I was doing my experiments with compost piles and uh, worm composting. And it was so magical, so mind-blowing for me. I just fell in love with that. And I was invited by an, uh, uh, an old teacher to go and teach uh, worm com composting in a very poor community 
in the same mountain I grew up in. And I went there, uh, and it was terrible. I was a very bad teacher at the time. But two weeks after that, they called me again because they had already implemented the worm farms, and now they wanted to move towards food production. And uh, at that moment, it all clicked on me because I realized that there was a revolution that could happen there. And it was a revolution that didn't need much money or a lot of resources or knowledge. It was simple things you could teach people so they become empowered and able to be self-sustaining up to a point. And I realized that so many things were around this simple idea, uh, mm -hmm. food culture, health, uh, social ties, networking and all that. And I began to dream about having an organization who could work towards that. And that was the, the first moment. Then the second moment when, came when I was working in the Amazon for, with a big NGO uh, from the capital city of Quito. And two years I worked there. And uh, I realized a lot of ugly things about how international cooperation and the NGO movement works. And I realized that the subject driving this, 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 this evolution uh, of the work of, of the cooperative sector uh, was not the farmers or the indigenous peoples, but the need of urban professionals to justify their salaries. And they will create in their desks projects that will then, they, they will try to impose on the farmers and indigenous peoples living on the countryside. And it never worked. Most of it was a failure after some years. And the project I was working on was a good example of that. There were so many constraints. But the, 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 pro the main problem was that the main idea of the project didn't come from the people on the field. It came from some wise academic scientists in the city. Mm -hmm. And I was very angry with this. I was thinking, how can you decide to, that you can design a better life for people on, on the countryside? It's just not true. It's, it's, it's such a, a, a high level of colonialism, you know, colonial thinking. So, well, from this second idea too came the final idea wrapping up into an organization where the people who design the processes and make them happen are the people who are in the countryside, living there and having to deal with the consequences of whatever goes wrong in the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2000, I began looking for money uh, to create a seed bank. Nobody was talking about seeds at the time, and nobody wanted to fund it. And finally, in 2002, I made some money in, by traveling around and working overseas in, and came back to Ecuador with enough money to live for a year. And I put my time on that year to create the Seed Guardians Network to, to become mm -hmm. this organization I was mm -hmm. dreaming about. Yeah, that's basically mm -hmm. 2002. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, it's very, very powerful. Always like the, like turning the problems into solutions. So what, what are the, the seed guardians network? Like with all what you saw, what are the, the solutions that you now, yeah. Okay, we are a network of uh, around 100 families mm -hmm. in most, uh, all regions of Ecuador, 17 out of the 23 or 24 provinces of the country. And basically, we are families who either decided to abandon careers and go to the countryside, near rural people, you know, or people who, who were farmers by tradition and decided not to go away mm -hmm. uh, from their farms or came back, went to study in the city and came back. So one of these three situations. But in all cases, we live in small farms um, and uh, try to implement alternatives in everything we need. So the first thing is obviously food production. So we are all uh, permaculturalists and we try to adapt permaculture to the regions, uh, to the realities of the regions we are living in. So for example, Ecuador has a very high amount of native plants. And we, we have learned that it's better for us to work with them, not exclusively, but we always try to find 
the plants, the ancestral techniques that work in the region, obviously incorporating new things too, but we try to understand which are the food systems best suited for every region where the family is. Because our families didn't, don't get support from, from outside. Like we, as a network, we don't pay the families to do this. So everyone has to look out for themselves and be able to survive on their own food, first of all. But then come a lot of other things like how you build your house, mm -hmm. how you cook your food, how you dress, how you heal yourself, how you educate your children. And in all cases too, uh, we always come to the realization that we cannot have a good life if we are separated from the communities around us. So we have to intervene uh, in one way or another. Like in, in one case, for example, it was a guy who, who found out that the best way to do it was to, lock, to work with the local parish. And he is actually an atheist. But now the, the, the how do you say the parish, the, the, the priest of the parish is his best friend. Because the, this priest was the only person willing to listen about reforestation with native trees. So he began to talk in the church about this after talking with my friend, with our seed gardener. And now they are like moving the little town towards that direction. That was an example. Another example was the, the place where you are going to volunteer, Paulina from Mashpi. She has a, a son that now is almost eight years old. And when she moved there, she moved from the city to this isolated region in the cloud forest. He realized that the, there was only one little school and the teacher was a crazy guy, guy accused of raping the, chi the, the, the children of the school. And she was like, well, where is my son going to go to school? So now this teacher is out and Paulina got the director and the two female teachers of the school to, to get a basic uh, training in Montessori schooling mm -hmm. and they got the Ministry of Education to accept that this school paid by the state is going to be a Montessori school, which is huge in our country. And uh, this movement of the school be, was like the, the, the initial cell of, of the new women's group there that is changing the mindset and the livelihoods of people in this small community. So we see that always our seed gardens, even if in the beginning it's just food production, it ends up transforming the social structure of mm -hmm. the place towards what we call regenerative lifestyles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's actually, yeah, these, these examples, they show so well that it's all interconnected. It's the like, yeah, living close to nature and then it's automatically to community because also in the, when you look at it from the regenerative food, regenerative commu uh, community, it's also when from circular economy, you cannot do circular economy by yourself. You mm -hmm. need to cooperate locally, maybe also across borders, depending on what you need. So it's always like, um, yeah, with nature and people and of course, there's also an economic context because that's how we interact in some way. And yeah, how do you, how do the families, um, yeah, s survive on an uh, economic level? Because you said they don't receive support, and and you as a network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about that. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is that we survived, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It was amazing to see the the good quality of life that mm -hmm. uh, the people of our network were having through this terrible time. It saddens me that it was so bad for a lot of people, especially the, the urban poor. Uh, people in the rural areas, areas were just significantly, significantly better than the people in the urban. But especially our seed guardians were having a blast, a great time because more economy was moving for, for them. And my, my reflection in the time was that the reason why it was so good for us was that we have been preparing for a collapse of society for decades by unplugging ourselves from dependence on, on the industrial system and commerce and all that. But even having said that, like our survival is, is actually yeah, uh, ensured by our own food production and our social network and the exchange we do between mm -hmm. ourselves and all that. 
But we, at some level, we actually struggle. We are not, we, we, live, we live without really knowing what the future holds ahead uh, in economical terms. We, ha we lack access to the market, for example, things like that. And this is a huge discussion here. But one of the points for me is that no one has ever uh, made an economy, a good economy, only with farming. Uh, yes, there was people. There were people who were reduced to only farming, and those were the serfs in the Middle Ages, or people today who are driven into that corner for a lot of reasons. But farms that were self-sustainable were always complex economies. Mm -hmm. They had different ways of making economy, and not only money. Huh? That's another thing. Like. Like here, the, the ancient economy of the, of the is not bartering, it's more complex like, like, than that. We call it Aini, which in Quechua means reciprocity. Uh, the gift economy, anthropologists call it too. So the gift economy is a huge thing for us, and it could cost uh, on, the, on the money side. But when we want to get money, every farm has different strategies to do that. that I, I mean, they do education, a lot of them do tourism at some level, They'll pr they produce like uh, first degree things like, I don't know, avocados and lettuces and that, but also secondary things like marmalades, uh, ham and things like that, you know. Uh, and some of them are part of projects that work with money from the international cooperation and things like that. So it's a mixed economy in all cases. Or they do construction work or they work also as teachers or whatever else. Uh, I think that uh, how the food system works right now, the, the amount of money you can get by producing just food will not bring you into the level of middle class. Uh, the fact that people want cheaper and cheaper food is a problem for us because the industry obviously can produce very cheap food because they externalize the costs, right? Mm -hmm. So they are not paying for how much they are destroying the environment, how badly they are paying their employees and all that. And other factors that go into transportation, for example. Transportation is one of the biggest uh, CO2 emitters in, in the world and that doesn't get into the account. Or, or a better example, you can buy a pig, for example, here that has been industrialized. And this pig uh, will grow will double the size of an organic pig in half the time. That means that per pound, one of our organic, traditional, healthy pigs is four times cheaper just to, you know, to create the food than an industrialized one. So we have to charge four times more for that, is, is our work and all that. But people will not pay for it. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to, access to good food to be denied to the urban poor, for example. So it's very, very tricky. So the market will impose into food production today uh, such low levels of, of, of monetary earnings that it's impossible to, to, to be middle class, for example, here in Ecuador. And I always tell, tell people here in the city, try to understand that you, by wanted, wanting the, people, the, the food to be cheaper, you are condemning the farmers to subsidize your food with their, with their misery, just like that. That's the truth. And if I, if, if I foresee a future where this social injustice doesn't exist anymore, it will mean that most of us will have to become food producers at some level. Doesn't mean we, we will all become farmers. But a hundred years ago, the city of Quito was famous for being full of gardens everywhere. And nobody was thinking about not producing at least some fruit or, or medicinal herbs or something in the garden. Because it really doesn't make sense to buy lettuces. That, that plant is mostly water, <laughs> you know? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's so easy to grow by yourself that it doesn't make sense that someone will put their lives uh, uh, depending only in selling some lettuces. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm branching out, I'm sorry. That's def <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's, that's definitely important to, to flag, and there's many, there's many movements just, just coming up like with, this, like, um, with the intention to really 
pay what is really worth it and also this urban far farming like because it's not it's not only people really uh, crave this uh, in the cities this this nature and the, to to see this freshness because it it's also acting on so many other levels from air quality and mm -hmm. uh, to 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 get the connection back to nature because if you're only in the city it's completely lost as you uh, also felt uh, already at young age mm -hmm. and um do you do you think this this is something that will emerge um uh, within the next years sadly or? i uh I don't have, uh, how you call it, this magic crystal ball <laughs> to see the future, but there are different avenues of, mm -hmm. of possible development. Sometimes I think that in our network, we are already living in one of these possible futures. Because in, in fact, we have managed to maintain uh, this, this concept of our indigenous people called the Sumac Causay, which can be translated as a good or right livelihood. Uh, and it's very interesting as a concept because the focus obviously is not in profit but in, in living a good life. And uh, you, you need some money for that, but not so much. And mm -hmm. uh, actually having too much of it goes against the, the, this right way of living. You don't feel so comfortable when you are keeping guard over million, millions of dollars. Well, that's another mm -hmm. thing, but... Uh, the, we are living already in our community across the country. Uh, we are healthy without having to use medicines. Uh, we are providing a wonderful education for our, for our children, which is really a privilege, but it's not costing us really a lot of money, like almost mm -hmm. no money, actually. And we are eating better than anyone else. So sometimes it's, it's like... Uh, sometimes we are earning less than, than, than a cashier at the supermarket, but we are living healthier, happier, and better lives than the much, most rich people of Ecuador. Mm. It, and it's true, just like that. But this is only one of the possible futures. Mm. I think it's feasible that people can move in this direction, you know? And I think we're proving this is true. Mm -hmm. Because we're living in rural areas, we are having a, uh, to spend much money and these wonderful lives. But there are forces today in the world that definitely are not going in that direction. And sadly, still, this, this profit above, above everything mentality is what is governing the world. And is driving us towards the cliff, you know, towards extinction. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's why I was telling before that we have been preparing for, for the catastrophe. Yeah, we are afraid of that. And, and if it's not COVID, it is the, the crisis of petroleum or the global economical crisis or all of the other crises that are, well, cr climate crisis, obviously, are jumping on one another. And, and in the end, these are just one crisis. It's a, it's the model of civilization we have created is unsustainable. Mm. And we are reaching the final moments of it. And these final moments can go another couple hundred years, maybe. So we see ourselves uh, as keepers of, of these knowledges and experiences and this narrative that we are trying to tell the world. It is actually possible to live a different life. And this life is ecologically sustainable. Uh, it's beautiful and is uh, economically feasible. So please <laughs> try to realize that. So yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but. that's a that's, um, perfect answer because it is about the local res resilience, this connection. And that's actually, when we look back into crisis hundreds of years ago, wars, it is always this local resilience. It's, um, it's, 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 the, it's the key and yeah. Mm. But let me say something. Mm -hmm. The problem we, we usually have is that, for example, today we were writing a project because we need to f find funding to provide digital education reaching the countryside too. Uh, but uh, one of our partners was saying, we, we just have to focus in food sovereignty and, um, and climate. No more than that. Because otherwise, our, the, po the, the, the potential uh, funders for this will not understand the complexity of what we do. And we were discussing that because it's very sad that you, you cannot make people understand that. You cannot make it sustainable in one place like the community you are going to go, go in Mashpee. 
the food by itself, if you don't work also cultural identities, like be proud of your ancestors and the way they used to cook cassava, because otherwise you will be just boiling cassava with salt and it is so boring, <laughs> you know. Uh, or, or even more important, uh, reproductive health. So people often ask us, why are you talking about reproductive health? You are the seed guardians. <laughs> it's because we live in the countryside and we realize how little knowledge there is, how the girls go into their first menstruations uh, without support, without understanding, feeling ashamed for, for they are carrying the, 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 you know, the signals of, of, of the original sin and this mentality, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we become desperate with this because we realize the needs that people have locally and we need to answer to that, no matter what it is. Maybe what they need is a tablet to, to watch a Netflix because they are bored in the night, but, well, that's what they need because otherwise they, they will be so bored there, the kids, that they will want to go to the city. So how do you transform the whole thing? If you just mm -hmm. work in one or two things, it is just impossible. So maybe it's crazy, but we have diversified in so many things. Uh, we try to cover all these aspects in the same time. Like mm -hmm. For example, cooking for me is one of the most important things we work with. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, um, yeah, I completely agree that th that's the approach of a regeneration as a whole. And uh, that's also the, the beauty of it, that it's like everything is connected. And uh, yeah, we need all of it. And I, when we communicate about, when I talk to people about it, <clears throat> they, it's so, because, of, because it's so many different things, it is also difficult to understand mm -hmm. for people. And so how, how do you uh, approach that in the communication? Because you're communicating so so much about regeneration, how, how do you approach that, like this kind of holistic aspect of regeneration? I think that we do it slowly, because mm -hmm. as you say, it's difficult to understand. Why it is difficult to understand? Because in, in the city, in, in this modern society, we now are externalizing more and more things of our lives. We pay for other people to, to, to take care of our health. We pay for, to other people to, to the system to take care of the education of our, of our kids and all that. So it's difficult to make someone realize that all these things could be actually in your hands and in, in your community's hands. And, and that's the basic idea, like take back the, the, the control and responsibility of doing all these things, not by yourself alone, but within your community. So it's basically everything from how and where you shit, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. to how you educate in, in your kids in sexual reproductive health, for, for example, mm -hmm. is everything. But mm -hmm. how do we approach the general public? Well, in the countryside, it's not so difficult because the interventions, interventions that our partners, uh, the members of the network do in the countryside, always answer to whatever people tell them there. For example, in one case, people were very angry because school was really miserable, in, the, in, in their little community in the coast, Rio Muchacho. So the farm decided to create a school. Uh, for 20 years, they provided schooling for the valley there. Simple, the people tell you what they need. And obviously you don't try to push them too much out of their comfort zone because the mentality uh, in the countryside is quite conservative actually. So you have to go slowly and yeah. And you know already they think you're a crazy urban hippie or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, just don't push them too much. But the change can be made. It's, you have to be very respectful and delicate about it. Those are your neighbors, probably for life, so you don't want to fight them. Okay. In the cities, it's a little bit more complicated. And we are using digital networks to do so, like social networks. So, for example, um, we are using Facebook which is, I think, an awful application, <laughs> but is, it has become very useful for us. We decided to work Facebook like, uh, through small posts that are always educational. So it's just one paragraph with a nice picture of illust or illustration, and it will teach you something. Even if you want to promote, like, for example, bread, we are selling new bread in our little store, but we will make a post explaining 
uh, what a good bread is. And if you want to taste something like this, you can come here. So for everything we do in Facebook and Instagram, we try to do an educational post. And this year, uh, no, 2021, we reached out to more than 3 million people which for Ecuador is quite impressive, actually. And uh, it's still like, I don't understand how, how it happened. <laughs> it's magic for me. But we have a good person working on that. And all of our employees, quote unquote, are not really employees. They are all, all, all of us, we are seed guardians and part of the network. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing. We don't hire outside people, to technicians, whatever. No, you have to be inside, like, putting your hands on the earth and, and cooking you know, your own food. You have to really believe what we're doing if you want to work with us. We also have this educational platform, which is just starting to grow up. And the idea was, you know, all the digital education you can find today, like Udemy and courses in, in online. So we want to do something like that, but with a twist. It has to be made with top quality. We are providing filming for the seed guardians. We are, we are being very careful on the quality and practicality of the things we teach. So we just have some, a little number of workshops and courses until now, but it's growing up and it's very, very good, very interesting. And we are providing, it's, you have to pay for the courses, but we are also providing free options for farmers organizations and indigenous organizations and the urban poor. And finally, we have the podcast. Uh, it's a small podcast. We only reach in the first season 50,000 people. That's, yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah, but it's, well, we want to yeah. grow. And it, it grow. is amazing. Like, mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't be saying this, but it's actually my favorite podcast because I love the people talking there. And I don't know all of them, but their life experiences. Like one of the last ones was Marta Rotingo. She's a Quechua indigenous uh, midwife and uh, her telling the story of how she became a midwife and the struggles with the state and the medical establishment and the beautiful stories she has lived through through that it's just mind-blowing makes you cry like not, not of sadness but, but uh, uh, of being grateful that people like that still walk the earth and people who really want to fight I remember in October 2019 there was a really big struggle between the indigenous people and the government, and the country was paralyzed. And I called her, and she was walking to the city of Quito. She walked nearly all the night. So she walked like eight hours to reach the city, because they were no, no, in the night. But she was coming not only because she wanted to help and participate in the strike, but also she, because there was a baby coming and she was the midwife. So she walked the whole night from her, the, her community to the city and went to the, this patient house to bring a baby to the world after walking eight, eight hours. And then she went to the strike in Quito to fight the government. So there's people like that. Mm. And it's wonderful to know and, and to get to know them, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing, wow. And in... In your educational platform, you teach about the permaculture or also other topics? It, that's the thing. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. are there other topics really? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we sometimes, sometimes we joke about this. We are permaculturizing everything. <laughs> like, like, for example, some of, of the couples in our network are having couple troubles right now. And we are saying there must be a permacultural way to deal with marriage and monogamy and all this. Like, we are sure that we can permaculturize everything because it means trying to redesign how we live uh, to respect our nature and the nature of our animals mm -hmm. and our plants, the forests, etc. It's just find a way to, to express our nature. So, yeah, the platform is permaculture, but you can also find there you will find uh, in a few weeks um, a course by this woman, Marta Rotingo, about how they do midwifing and bring babies to the world in their community. Mm -hmm. And this is permaculture. And in, in, in this course, you will see how she cultivates or let grow some herbs in her garden 
that are needed mm -hmm. for midwifing. But there are others that you can only find up in the hills because they will never grow in a garden. They just don't want to. So this brings a discussion about what is wild, what is cultivated. Will you be sustainable and happy with just your garden? What happens if, if all these high hills where the wild plants are, are burned or destroyed? This whole thing will, will, will disappear. Midwifery will not be the same without these plants. So, all this is permaculture from our point of view. So fighting against the mining companies, the oil spill right now in the Amazon, that's permaculture. Mm -hmm. But also teaching things like, I don't believe in Reiki, but one of the things that the people in the Amazon, the patients that suffered the oil spills in the 90s, they love learning about Reiki. You know Reiki, this human yeah. with hands? Yeah, I, I don't believe in it. I... Discuss me if you want, but I don't believe it. But they do. Mm. And they are happy with it. <laughs> and they have the, the right to be. So in the Amazon, one of the things that were taught was this. Is this permaculture? Yes, of course it is. It's mm. all part of it. And how you build your house and all that. But if you want me, we, we can discuss more plants. <laughs> because that's no, the first thing people tell us about our plants. Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely also what fascinates me about permaculture, basic, basically the, the, the concepts of it and what we can learn in, uh, from it, how we can apply it in so many different areas in life, as you say, in all areas, basically. And so what, how would you say, what is the, the essence of permaculture, if it is even possible to say uh, that can be applied to, yeah, to a, a life on an in individual level, but also on a collective systemic level. Like, um, yeah, how, how would you connect all of that? You know, there are as many definitions of permaculture as mm -hmm. permaculturalists there are that out there. Mine is that, uh, you know, systemic thinking, this mm -hmm. way of understanding processes as systems. For me, permaculture is... Uh, uh, systemic thinking applied uh, to the practice of how we live our lives, basically that. And uh, in, in, not in imitation, but in following our nature and the nature of every part of the process. Because if something is not following its nature, then it will be broken. So the cow's place is out in the field, for example, and a cow will be completely happy out there, but not inside of a barn forever. Like, you know, the industrialized meat system and all that. And the same applies to everything, including our own psyches and how we live our lives. So that for me is permaculture. And for me, it has a social responsibility. Uh, because if it's, it's useless, if it cannot bring a transformation to the lives of those people who most need it. But you cannot go as a preacher there to tell them, because I come from, from the city with the sacred book, you know, this written by Bill Mollison, it's not like that. You, you have, is that our, our families have done that, the families of the network. You have to go there with all humility to learn from the people there. How do you live in that place? Also, I think permaculture is the crossroads between a personal experience, your personal observation following Fukuoka, Masanobu Fukuoka, modern science, real science, and that means not necessarily what the academy today, sponsored by the big corporations, believe to be true, but real science, which is not only papers. Just a few days ago, I watched this video by Alan Savory, another great guy, the founder of the holistic uh, uh, cow management system. And he was saying how it is very dangerous for science, this belief that only peer review uh, articles in journals are science because this is just the one part of it science is very complex and everyone can do it yeah but science we do believe in science but also ancestral knowledge so it's all these things coming together you know my personal experience ancestral knowledge and science coming together and interacting there with the purpose of bringing happiness to the land and the people there Mm -hmm. in an equitable way so yeah uh, and sometimes this is, is crazy the, the meanings of this for example 
uh, a couple months ago, one of our most important seed guardians, she's an indigenous farmer, and her father is getting old. And she called us to tell us, I want to make a course for the educational platform about how to kill animals and how to cut them in pieces and store them in. And we were like, ooh, this is going to be dangerous, you know? We are already under attack by vegans, already. And not only will be the vegans, but also the state wants to control, completely control the killing of, the, of all animals. So there's a law we are fighting against right now that tells indigenous people if the, the, this law finally comes out and is applied as it is written, they will force indigenous farmers to drive hours to a, 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 a state-sponsored abattoir mm. to kill a couple guinea pigs. And this will destroy food sovereignty. But if we make this course, these people also will be like watching us. Are, are you promoting that people turn to kill their cows in the farms again? This is forbidden by law today. Today you have to bring the cow to the state sponsor abattoir. But our country, it says the first line of the constitution of our country, it says that we are a plurinational and intercultural state of rights. And Pacha, this friend, told, told us, okay, my father is going to die with all this knowledge, and nobody in the community is learning about this. How are we going to survive when this shit collapses? And there will, no, there will be no fuel to bring the animals to the abattoir and all that. How are we going to survive if, if this knowledge is lost? I don't care about vegans or, or, or state officials. I need to preserve the knowledge of my culture, so please help me. And we say, okay, <laughs> it will be a risk, but we are taking it. We have to do that. It, it is why we're here. Isn't it also, I mean, to to have a, a specific point of view on on anim, on how to to work with animals on on this kind of respectful, holistic way, mm -hmm. which most vegans might not be against if they really yeah, or there, there maybe there are all kinds of vegans. You all, know. There are all kinds of it, but to I mean. Everyone in this world has a different opinion on everything, but yeah. uh, so uh, and um, yeah, at, at least this kind of natural way of, of, of living, where where and also this is also something that indigenous people uh, treat animals with a lot of respect, and um, mm -hmm. and the animal also basically when they're in this connection, when they kind of um, offer themselves for just life going on so it kind of uh, yeah to to use this as an approach at least this is how how i i personally see it um if it's like in this respect and yeah but yeah it is yeah, i i totally understand like this all these different um opinions and forces that are going on but with I, the i'm happy we touched this because mm -hmm. I, i wasn't thinking before about that but mm -hmm. interculturality is one of the aspects I think must be paramount in permaculture. Because mm -hmm. otherwise we run the risk of trying to promote just one size fits all strategy, you know, like permaculture as a manual of techniques that can be applied everywhere in the world. And that is simply not true. And because some permacultural people from the global north do that, there is a, a, a movement, especially in the indigenous uh, peoples of North America, against permaculture already, calling it colonizing. And uh, when, I, when I think about what I know of some of these gurus of the, of the global north, I realize they're right in their criticism. But it, I don't think it applies to us because we're trying to create indigenous, in plural, permacultures. And uh, the basic ideas will always be the same. For, for me, I don't mind if it sounds cheesy and romantic, but the, the final purpose of, or, or a strategy of permaculture is love. I remember one, one case we had, like Javier Herrera, our best uh, chicken, how you say, permaculturalist? I don't know. The first time he had a, a disease coming in his chickens, he, one chicken was sick. And, and the doctor said, you have to kill it, kill all the ones who were in the same little 
group as, as, as hair, and then the, put antibiotics in all of them. And he, wanted, he didn't want to do that. So he found an alternative method. And for two weeks, he was waking up at four o'clock in the morning to clean the ears and eyes and nostrils of his 200 chickens, one by one. It took him nearly four hours every day. And not a single chicken died. So that's why his eggs are more expensive too. But I mean, that is love. Love is the only reason that will compel you to do something like that. So that's our answer to the whole of this industrialized world, to Bill Gates and his proposals of, of diets and, and to Monsanto and also to vegans and the, the state and everywhere. This is what we, what we want to do. And, and our, the relationship we have with our plants and seeds and animals is one of love and tribe and family. And we will not give, give this up, you know. We will fight for it. And just this past week, we finally won a constitutional lawsuit against the law on seeds. The law on seeds was, was created in 2016. We intervened there and, and managed to reduce the damage that was being done by this law. But in 2017, we, put, we filed a, suit, a lawsuit against this law. And finally, four years after, we, we won in the essentials. And now Ecuador is constitutionally, by law and all that, I think the only country in Latin America where the law says that we farmers are allowed to produce, give away, sell, commercialize our seeds with no need of any form of registration. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's crazy to think because, you know, when I was younger, I was into going into nature, not into working with lawyers about laws. I mean, it was ugh, such a foreign idea to me, but I became a, an expert in this kind of stuff because we needed it. And we're just farmers, but we managed to change this because it was needed. So that's, that's the call for everyone listening to this. Like, don't ever feel unempowered. Mm -hmm. You have to find more people, like-minded people, and just start doing stuff. And it's a responsibility, mm -hmm. really. Because the world is going down fast. So. Definitely. And what is your, your yeah, advice, your secret that you recommend to, to people who want to develop something? Because there's also always so many challenges uh, that you also know, speak about. And uh, yeah, once you start doing things, you, you just meet so many <laughs> hurdles. That, so what do you... Um, what, do you, what is your secret to mm. go for? <laughs> Be desperate. <laughs> First of all, I think we need to surrender to our unis, unis, our desperation. And mm -hmm. be aware that you really need to do something. It's not like, yeah, I feel sad sometimes, but I will go to the office on Monday and watch Netflix and everything will be all right. No, give in into your desperation. Really feel it because you're right. You're right by feeling that. And then don't stay there. Do something practical immediately. And you can start by yourself. Mm -hmm. I would say by, by making cheese in your kitchen. You know? Or making sauerkraut, you, you call mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. Kimchi, I, I, I call it the Korean version I like. But whatever, whatever, you know. If you have kids, okay, what are you doing for them? Like, really. And then <laughs> join with other people. That's the thing. We have to take our hands across neighbors, across cities, across nations, across continents. We need to join forces. We need to know that we are not alone. And uh, yeah, make these groups to do something specific. Like, for example, here nearby where we are recording right now, there's a bunch of people from one neighborhood who decided to fight back the municipality who wants to this this touristic place to stand to that to that neighborhood and they don't want to because they know that it will be destroyed so they are quite well organized so organize and fight back is the thing but a fight back it doesn't mean violence it means proposals it means doing things i always tell people that the most important thing we can do for example is to get together every Saturday or maybe one Saturday in a month to discuss things, but 
eating, <laughs> cooking food together and eating and discussing what is happening to us and what we want to do mm -hmm. to, to, to improve things. And this is incredible. I can tell you that we Ecuadorians have survived until now in the midst of misery, of incredible misery and exploitation, just because we are very socially rich. Social capital is the most important thing in Ecuador. And I can assure you that no one has ever died of hunger in, of hunger in this country, ever. Even if you try to and you drop in the street and say, saying, I want to die of hunger, there, someone will come and funnel soup into you, you know. We will not let you die. And no matter how bad is the crisis, we survive because we help each other. Because we needed that uh, since the beginning of the, uh, of the invasion in the 16th century in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do that and it's the most important thing. So that's it. Don't, don't let this system isolate you. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Do practical things, don't let them isolate you. Join other people and just start doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's another thing. Don't believe in the narratives they are telling us. Just don't. And I would point to start, I think is what we call the Bible in the permacultural movement, because no other book is as good as that, that one. The Permaculture Designer's Manual by Bean Mollison has a lot of social analysis too. And it will help you realize where science fits in all this. And it doesn't dominate everything. And where ancestral knowledge fits. And where spirituality fits too. Because we need all these things. But no one of them should do dominate completely what we do. Uh, definitely right now they are feeding us narratives that are in conflict with reality. Yeah. And that's very important. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's... <laughs> too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm... Uh, yeah, um, it really hits the point very, very clearly, and um, yeah, and it's actually very, very good call, call to action, embracing everything of of life. And is there anything else that you would like to share? Or would you like that you would like the listeners to take away from for for their lives? Uh, for your lives. Um, I, I will not put myself as, ex as an example, but I want you to tell to know that I didn't go to university. I just, I'm just a terrible student. And I am really no one. I'm just a guy with a lot of personal conflicts. <laughs> and a little boy, I have a son that's seven years old, and his well-being is my main worry in, in life right now. But I'm very proud of the things we have done in our network because we are just like that all of us just simple people and simple people when they really want to can change the world at least we have changed the life of, of a lot of people surrounding us in, in in local communities and in the cities and all that and it's very impressive and it's very healthy the feeling of waking up each day knowing you are doing your best and mm -hmm. something is changing at least you are putting your your grain of sand whatever um uh yeah if you come to Ecuador, try to find us, because there are volunteer opportunities and other things. And we have to help each other. I don't know exactly how, <laughs> but there are ways that we can be connected and help each other. Like to spread information, to spread campaigns, to help collect funds for special things. To, uh, But also, we can help you a lot. Like, I have been in Europe, I, I'm, I'm working one Carter French too. So I have been there too. And the level of the realization I feel that, uh, there, it, it is amazing. It's like Europe is becoming more and more unconnected in the cities especially from real life. And I do believe that you need that. And Latin mm -hmm. America is a great place. And Ecuador is a nice place to do it too. So if you feel you need it, just come here with a good heart and a willing to help and you will go away transformed. Yeah. By, yeah, by, by what it means, the real struggle of being alive and being human. You know, mm -hmm. and, and it's something very, very beautiful. I too, I, I was raised in the city initially, but later on living in the countryside with farmers, that's my, the best experience in life. 
really. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. It was also the first time when I was here 14 years ago in Ecuador. It completely changed my life. And now, now again, and it's actually really this drive to want to uh, live connected to nature on a constant basis and and still there's cities and there's a lot of advantages also to live in a city mm -hmm. and there's actually small things already starting in Barcelona there's for example permaculture initiative uh, mm -hmm. within the city so yeah uh, let's see where this develops too but there is um, good good things of starting to flourish and mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how can people contact or get in touch with you the best way? Um, maybe you will put notes in the podcast too. Yeah. So there. But we have uh, in, in Facebook, we are called Guardianes de Semillas. Just all the whole world like that. World like that. You can also find us Guardianes de Semillas in, in, on Instagram. We have a web page. Uh, mm -hmm. I can write you yeah. redsemillas.org and um, yeah, those yeah. are main, main ways of contacting us uh, we don't answer that uh, quickly to, especially to mail, we are kind of slow to, to emails, but yeah uh, yeah, those are the main avenues okay, yeah yeah, uh, I will definitely, we will Everyone will see that in the show notes for sure. Yeah, and also the podcast Radio Semilla and the yeah. educational platform. Yeah. And the thing mm. is, yeah, don't give up hope. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to give up hope. I know how horrible everything is, but one of the best things I have managed to do in my life is to be insanely hopeful <laughs> for the future. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have a son. I believe we can do it. This is just mm. too stupid a way to to let like to go as mm. as a, a species humanity is smarter than this. We really have to fight back. Mm. And we have to start with our own lives. Definitely. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you very much for for these inspiring uh, insights and also to see it in action how it is really um, transforming people's lives and communities thanks a lot that's definitely giving a lot of hope to mm -hmm. to me for sure and i hope also to the listeners and yeah thank you <laughs> thank you very much wow this was definitely food for inspiration thank you very much for listening and we hope that you can take something with you from this episode to dive deeper into regeneration subscribe to the podcast via the email list and on the respective channels online. Our next episode is about regenerative tourism and how it supports the conservation of the Amazon forest and the indigenous cultures with Ramiro Uagas from the Achua people. We're looking forward to having you joining next time.